Thank you very much. And before I begin my talk on the studies on Escherichia coli 0157 in domestic animals, the Cavite State University experience, is it all right if I share a little bit about my university? Okay, Cavite State University had its humble beginnings as Indam Intermediate School in 1906 with the American Thomasites as its first teachers. It later became the Indang Farm School and then the Indang Rural High School where the agricultural work was integrated finally into the academic course. And then it became the Don Severino National Agricultural School. And in 1964, by virtue of Republic Act 3917, it became known as the Don Severino Agricultural College. And currently, it is called as Cavite State University by virtue of Republic Act 8468 in January 2022, 1998. So our main campus located in Indang Cavite sits on a 72 hectare lot. And currently, we have 141 undergraduate and graduate courses, as well as six non-degree programs offered in the university. Now, my journey on the study of Escherichia coli 0157H7 is what I can call as a serendipitous experience. So it happened by accident. I was at the hallway of DVPS, the Department of Veterinary Paraclinical Sciences at the College of Vet Med in UPLB. In 2002, my then master's thesis advisor, Dr. Maria Fevismano, saw me and she just told me, do your thesis on E. coli 0157. And of course, who can say no to your thesis advisor? And this is actually my training that become my training, began my training on how to reach out to other people for help. And I just took the risk. I decided to send an email to a manufacturer of Antisera on EHEC at Denkaseiken, Japan. And originally, I was just asking how much the Antisera cost. And he decided, by the name of Mr. Kevin Ming, and he decided to donate the Antisera and test kits to me. And of course, that was a lot of help for, for my research. And his request was that we acknowledge in my publication, Denkaseiken, Japan. And of course, I had a lot of help from Dr. Susan Mercado and Dr. Francis Elegado in biotech. They were the ones who provided me the reference strains for E. coli 0157H7. And I continued this research upon my reinstatement in Cavite State University in 2004 because of a practical reason. I still had a lot of media and reagents left. And also because there is still this burning question, do other domestic animals harbor the organism? But what is E. coli 0157H7 exactly? Interestingly, it was given the moniker, the hamburger bacterium, because the very first reported outbreak in the United States was attributed to an undercooked beef patty served at, at a popular fast food restaurant. It belonged to the diarrheogenic E. coli class called enterohemorrhagic Escherichia coli. It produces the Shiga toxins, and the, the term was previously called verotoxin. The toxins were previously called verotoxins because of its activity against vero cells, which are a line of African green monkey kidney cells. And for a while, it was also called Shiga like toxins, but now the more appropriate or acceptable name for the toxin would be shiga toxin and the diarrhea caused by the organism is characterized by bloody and mucoid diarrhea also called as hemorrhagic colitis with the person suffering from little to no fever 
And sadly, in 5% to 10% of these diarrhea cases, it can lead to the condition known as hemolytic uremic syndrome. And commonly, those affected are the very young, the very old, and immunocompromised patients. And this condition is characterized by an end-stage renal failure or disease. But how is this possible? How can an organism that can cause diarrhea cause this end-stage renal failure? And the answer to that is because the Shiga toxin binds to this receptor called the GB3 or globotriacyl ceramide, which are plentiful in the endothelial cells. And of course, these are the cells lining the blood vessels. And glomeruli, as we know, are a network of small blood vessels or capillaries. So once they attach to that, they will then travel to the endoplasmic reticulum. It will target the ribosomes and inhibit protein synthesis and eventually cause cell death. Many authors have already established that beef cattle or, or cattle in general are the natural reservoir of the organism, meaning they naturally carry the organism in their gut, but under normal conditions, they do not get sick because of the organisms. And it's interesting because the outbreak of E. coli 0157 from beef cattle started when cattle racers began using ionophores as feed additives. These ionophores are used to improve feed efficiency, reduce bloat, as well as coccidiosis, but it also tends to acidify incorrectly the rumen environment, and that allowed the E. coli 0157 to proliferate. And one thing interesting about the organism is that it is quite acidophilic as compared to other E. coli or the typical E. coli. And there was a study, in fact, wherein they inoculated soy sauce, and soy sauce has a pH of around 4.8. E. coli 0157 grew, but a typical E. coli did not. And of course, this is what we want to know if there are other domestic animal reservoir of the organisms. Humans, they become infected by consumption of contaminated milk, of course, a contaminated beef, as well as other foods such as radish sprouts, even contaminated apple juice, etc. And there can also be secondary human to human transmission. So for the next three years after I finished my master's, my students and I studied the organism in various domestic animals, particularly in livestock, and we obtained the following prevalence results. So we studied it from dairy cattle in Imus, in Lipa Batangas, also in Carabaos, in slaughtered swine, as well as domestic, domestic swine, and also in native cattle. And if you can see, before I thought it was just a coincidence, but isolates from swine showed that they are all non-H7, E. coli 0157, non-H7. And in 2010, you have this development of the Philippine Natural Animals, Philippine Native Animals Development Program. And we took advantage of that to study E. coli 0157 from native animals as well. The goal of PNAD would be to develop policies and initiatives for sustainable conservation, production, and marketing of native animals. And so to ensure that they are reared optimally, that includes studying whether diseases are also prevalent in this animal species. And hence, we isolated E. coli 0157 from native animal species as well. And these are the results of our studies. So we isolated it from cattle, native cattle, native pigs, and native goats. And later, I will be mentioning a little bit about this very interesting strain, E. coli 0157H43, which we isolated from native, native pigs. Okay, so when you do your isolation work or your research on E. coli 0157H7 or the enterohemorrhagic E. coli in general, it is always best 
to invest in um, supplements such as this one. This is the most popular, the Cefixime Potassium Telluride Supplement. And it is available commercially during that time in 2002-2003. This CTS Max supplement from Dynal already costs a lot. It's around 10,000 pesos, but maybe there are cheaper uh, sources available locally. So we use Cefixime. It's a third generation cephalosporin antibiotic to improve the selection because it inhibits the growth of proteus but not E. coli. Whereas Telluride is added as an additional selective agent because it's commonly used to culture other toxigenic microorganisms such as Corinibacterium, diphtheriae, and Dibrio cholerae. And you make use of the sorbitol maconchi agar. It's just like your maconchi agar, except that the substrate there is sorbitol because it takes advantage of the fact that EHEC in general cannot ferment the sugar sorbitol. So what can you expect from the medium? The concentration, by the way, for cefixime, it's 0 0.05 milligrams per ml per liter, milligrams per liter, potassium telluride, 2.5 milligrams per liter. And that would be the expected appearance of colonies on the SMAC. Colorless colonies with a smoky center. If you see that, there's a big chance that your isolate is an enterohemorrhagic Escherichia coli. Of course, we are talking about serotypes, and the way to identify that would be to use anti sera. So we have here the 0157 antiserum and the H7 antiserum. So E. coli has around 200 O serotypes and around 50 plus H serotypes. The O represent the part of the LPS, while the H, that is the flagella. And for the 0157 agglutination test, what you want to see would be the granular agglutination pattern visible to the naked eye as shown. And for the H7 agglutination reaction, you want to see the cloudy agglutination pattern as shown, but be careful not to move it a lot because it disintegrates very easily. So it's quite easy. The procedure is quite easy to do. You just follow the manufacturer's recommendation. And of course, we do molecular confirmation to detect the genes and we use as reference the publication by Wang et al. 2002. It's a very good publication. The conditions are already optimized, so we just followed it. So we identified the E. coli 16S rRNA, the RFB E0157, the H7PC gene, the Shiga toxins STX1 and XTX2. We didn't identify any more the variants of this toxin, especially STX2. And then we also identified the intimin gene, EAE, and the hemolysine gene. So more on the hemolysine, we also did follow the procedure by Boitin et al. in 1989, wherein they used wash sheep red blood cells instead of the ordinary red blood cells in your standard BAP. So you just follow the procedure by Boitin. It's called wash sheep red blood cells because the RBCs were washed repeatedly with PBS. And according to the authors, that would render the RBC more susceptible to hemolysis. And this is what we got. So this plate here, the upper part, represents colonies that are non-hemolytic on the wash sheep red blood cells, whereas this one, as shown by the arrow, you can see the zones of clearing on the wash sheep red blood cells. So what does this mean? According to Boitin, they noted that the hemolysine 
is frequently associated with Shiga toxin production because in their study, 89% of their isolates with the toxin also possessed hemolysin. And they said that there's a direct association such that they proposed that production of hemolysin can be used as an epidemiological marker for rapid and simple detection of potential Shiga toxin producing E. coli. So if you have a lot of isolates to identify, you can use um, the washi red blood cell, the hemolysin test proposed by Boitin et al. first, and then after seeing that these isolates have hemolysis, then you can do further testing for the presence of the Shiga toxin. And in our case, all native cattle isolates that produce zones of hemolysis on washed sheep red blood cells also possess the gene for Shiga toxin. And severe diarrhea and the hemolytic uremic syndrome were associated with strains with virulence markers such as intimin and also hemolysin. Only our native cat cattle isolates amplify genes for the STX1, intimin, and hemolysin, showing that indeed bovine remain as an important source of virulent E. coli 0157, further confirming that cattle is a known carrier of E. coli 0157. And although this study, our study detected only the virulence genes of isolates that agglutinated the 0157 antiserum, it is possible that there are other non-sorbital fermenting isolates that did not agglutinate the antiserums, as, and these could be strains belonging to a different serotype, because that was our limitation. We are only limited to identifying the serotypes 0157 and H7 because these are the current concern and also because the antisera, they are really quite expensive. And we also may have missed out on sorbitol fermenting EHEC isolates because indeed several authors have already mentioned that in a, using sorbitol maconchi agar, you can miss the other sorbitol fermenting EHEC isolates. So that's one of the limitations of the study. But SMAC with cefixime telluride remains to be the most practical media to use to study EHEC because it's a quite cheaper compared to other media. And as shown here, you have other, I'm sorry, you have other non-0157 serotypes implicated in hemolytic uremic syndrome. So for those of you who might be interested to do their work on other EHEC serotypes that are non-0157, you can consider studying those serotypes as well, as they are also implicated in HUS, in humans. And here we can see that we have this isolates from native animals. So P stands for the pigs, G for the goat isolates, and B for the bovine. Isolate. So they all agglutinated 0157 antiserum. They did not agglutinate the H7 antiserum, which means that they are of the non H7 serotype. And all animals sampled in the study were apparently healthy because they were non diarrheic, alert, and active. And we've also done antibiotic sensitivity test results. For the other studies I have mentioned, we have done studies on ASD there. So I will just be focusing on our native animal isolates. And we can see that the isolates show sensitivity to the um, newer classes of antibiotics such as phosphomycin and enrofloxacin. So this phosphomycin belong to phosphonic acid family. It is a broad spectrum of activity and was only recently used for the treatment of infections in poultry and pigs. And rofloxacin, it's a fluoroquinolone, but so far its use has been approved for dogs, pigs, and cattle, but not for poultry because it can promote the evolution of fluoroquinolone resistant strains of Campylobacter, which is a human pathogen. 
Okay. Ciprofloxacin, on the other hand, it is widely used in humans, dogs, and cats, but it's not recommended for use in cattle. And for the goat isolates, you can see that they are, almost all of them are susceptible to all the antibiotics examined. In general, Trias Cavite, you can see a lot of restaurants there serving goat dishes. So it's a delicacy in Cavite. And we conducted an interview among the farmers, and they said that their clients prefer goats that were organically raised. Unfortunately, we can see some resistance profile among the antibiotics, such as erythromycin, erythromycin, and cotrimoxazole. It's very common to find this resistance profile, particularly on erythromycin. Unfortunately, for this study, we didn't do detection of the antibiotic resistance genes for those specific antibiotics. And erythromycin, it's a macrolide antibiotic. It should be um, used, but responsibly because it's also being used to treat humans. The usefulness of antimicrobial therapy in EHEC cases remains unresolved. There are scientists saying that caution should be exercised in using antibiotics in cases of hemolytic uremic syndrome due to Escherichia coli 0157H7 because it can enhance production or liberation of the toxin. But Fukushima et al. suggests that some antimicrobials may prevent disease progression to HUS. So our studies show that native animals can potentially carry multi-drug-resistant EHEC. And in cases of bloody diarrhea in humans, it must always be approached or treated with caution, especially if the etiology is EHEC. So these are some of our publications on E. coli 0157. We have one from the Philippine Journal of Veterinary and Animal Sciences in 2009 for our study on dairy cattle in Batangas, Philippines. This one from the Philippine Journal of VetMed for our native cattle studies. And recently, we have this, the non-virulent Escherichia coli 0157H43 in native pigs from selected farms in Cavite, Philippines. And we obtained a prevalence of 3.3%. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first report of E. coli 0157H43 in native pigs and an E. coli 0157 strain that is not pathogenic in domestic animals in the country. So interestingly, I've, I came across publications on the same strain. They do not harbor any virulence genes typical for EHEC isolates, as well as for other E. coli pathotypes. And its role in the swine microbiome is still a subject for research, though many authors have already posited that EHEC in pigs typically are deficient in major virulence factors. So it's not an important um, disease in pigs. So other researchable areas, as the component vaccines, so it shows um, promise, as well as toxin neutralizers, either the monoclonal antibodies or GB3 mimics, because as we've discussed, the toxin binds to this particular receptor. So if there are receptors present that mimic GB3, then hopefully the organism will bind there. Some work was done in our university, but we still need to expound on that further, wherein we made use of hyperimmune serum raised on rabbits against crude extracts of Shiga toxins. So this monoclonal antibodies and GB3 mimics given parenterally up to 48 to 72 hours after infection can protect experimental animals from otherwise lethal outcomes. But there's a very narrow therapeutic window, so that becomes a challenge. We've also incorporated the results of our studies on foodborne pathogens in our lecture materials. 
and our students in food hygiene conduct palenque outreach like an extension activity where they go to the wet market of Indang Cavite. It's interesting because the palenque day in Indang Cavite is only during Wednesdays or Saturdays. So they went there, they discussed about the pathogens, salmonella, as well as E. coli, principally E. coli 0157H7. So this was before the pandemic, sometime 2017, and we're able to repeat that again in 2018. So they discussed simple um, concepts about where to put their food in the refrigerator, the proper hand washing technique, how to avoid cross-contamination. And you will be surprised that many people don't don't uh, know that yet or are not really aware of those things yet and these are my students and they are all licensed veterinarians already let me just show you a little bit about my college some pictures about our college and university so this is the college of veterinary medicine and biomedical sciences that's our academic building and this is our veterinary teaching hospital at the lower ground floor and at the second floor would be our laboratories including this laboratory the veterinary molecular diagnostic laboratory we are very lucky to be awarded funding by the bureau of animal industry to be one of the reference laboratories to detect african swine fever and this is the research center we have we have the multi disciplinary research building there. Very recently, we went there actually last week and took a picture of the laboratories. So at the fifth floor will be the my laboratory, the Foodborne Pathogens Lab. So we're still in the process of acquiring equipment. It became a big challenge because of the pandemic, but hopefully within the second quarter, those equipment will start to arrive. And we are quite lucky in Cavite State Universities because we have mechanisms in place to support researchers, both students and faculty members. That's why we were able to conduct a lot of those E. coli 0157 studies and other studies on foodborne pathogens. This one, the Faculty and Students Research Capability Enhancement Fund provides a maximum of 25,000 pesos per student as thesis support. As long as the studies are part of a research project by the thesis advisor, that project may be funded or not. And the study must first be approved by the thesis panel prior to submission for funding. And we also have the CVSU Research Grant or CRG, which grants a maximum of 200,000 pesos for faculty led research projects but it must be finished within two years, but extension is allowed for justifiable reasons. So this must be published in reputable journals once completed. So all those funding schemes were approved by our Board of Regents. And I'm happy to say, it was mentioned um, earlier, that currently we are doing a research to create a low-cost molecular lamp-based device to detect selected poultry pathogens in real time in the farm and this is in partnership of course with uplb our principal investigator is dr dennis b o'malley of uplb cdm together with um, engineer jp ramoso of sayat and we have dr jerry kammer of the university of eastern Philippines and the former director of the Bureau of Animal Industry, Dr. Ronnie Domingo. And we were fortunate to be included among the finalists to receive the Newton Prize Award. And of course, we are open for collaboration. Please feel free to reach out to me if there's anything I can help you with. We can collaborate, you can request to make use of our facilities in the university so please feel free to reach out to me anytime thank you very much